Um, relatively early, I guess. Um, I travel back and forth to both Britain and Ireland um, because my field is teaching Irish Gaelic and other Celtic languages, so I saw the books uh, on display as the Philosopher's Stone, and uh, probably, I guess that was in 97 at some point when they had um, come out, probably within about six months or eight months, I um, bought, a, I, guess, I guess maybe it was a full year when the American release came out is when I finally bought it. But I'd seen them, I was reading up a little bit on the the stir uh, about it and seeing some interviews with kids and you know the usual amount of press that it was getting but it wasn't it took about a year I'm sure somebody's probably calculated day by day the popularity of Harry Potter but it wasn't that well known in the United States for probably the first year then you got the scholastic edition then of course they started releasing them simultaneously eventually so there wasn't that delay anymore but that was uh, with the first and I guess what caught my attention about the books when I saw them in the store in England was um, the Sorcerer's Stone, um, Philosopher's Stone, I should say, because that's, that's the British title. Yeah, that's what I meant to say. Um, I've been interested in British children's fiction for as long as I can remember, including a lot of the boarding school type stories that this Harry Potter series is loosely based on. Um, particularly anything that might have been set in uh, kind of the fringes of the island of uh, England, Wales, and Scotland. So S Scotland, Wales, Cornwall, that sort of thing was especially interesting to me. So I guess, you know, just generally caught my attention. I also have a PhD in folklore, so it, you know, it kind of <laughs> just fit right in. <laughs> I loved it, yeah. And ironically, even though you know people are always asked, what's your favorite book? And most people say one of the later ones. I still really like the first one because I really see it as um, more closely tied to that children's fiction tradition that I really enjoyed. Part of how I got to know about the British boarding school stories is because when I was 10, we lived in India for a year, I was a child, and the books that were being marketed to children there are um, largely British. And so I discovered all that, loved it. They were adventurous. In retrospect, I wouldn't say that they were, you know, the greatest of literature that ever came out for children, but um, my sister and I loved reading them. And so when I got that first Harry Potter book, I thought, this reminds me so much of those books, but with all of the magic twist. And of course, uh, folklore is worked into it constantly, um, and uh, mythology, legend all the sort of local legends that might pertain to places, um, the place names, the setting, the whole idea of how you prepared to go to this boarding school. I think it was more prevalent in England um, some decades back that it wasn't like in the United States where most people consider boarding school to be very, very posh thing to do. There it was, I think, maybe more of a middle class thing to do. So 11-year-olds typically were going to be sent off to boarding school. There were special trains, uniforms, lists of things to get, um, the excitement of meeting new people, um, maybe older siblings in the school, like that would parallel for the Weasleys. So, so I still really enjoy the first book just because it, it kind of takes me back to the, that era in my own childhood, um, um, going to a British style school in India as well as having the British fiction. <laughs> Um, well, Irish is the main one that I use pretty much on a daily basis. I've also studied Welsh, uh, Scottish Gaelic or Gaelic, Breton. Um, I've sort of dabbled in Cornish and Manx because anyone who's done that many Celtic languages would probably do those two remaining ones. They are technically considered extinct by linguists, the, the last two, Manx and Cornish, but they each have revival communities probably maybe in the realm of a thousand speakers of revived Manx and revived Cornish. Um, probably not enough to support a Harry Potter translation, but you never know, you know. There's a Greenlandic uh, translation, so that's on my list of ones to pursue, so that's a pretty small speaker group, too. Um, I think it's about 54 languages, by the way, that, that Harry Potter's been translated into. Then I've studied um, French, German, Spanish, and Latin. And like I said, I lived in India for years as a child, so at that time I spoke Hindi fairly well. It's, it's pretty rusty, but I think it always left an impression on me as a child as to 
um, what life is like in a bilingual or multilingual culture. But of all of those, Irish is by far the one that I, I use the most.